Now I'd like to welcome to the show Andre Beliveau, who's Policy and Outreach Manager at the National Taxpayers Union Foundation. Welcome to Free the Economy, Andre. Thanks for having me, Richard. So to get started, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about you and your sort of career path and what led you to Washington, D.C.? I know you uh, have relatively, relatively recently moved here to D.C. and taken this position here in the in the in in the greater swamp area, as we call it uh, at NTU. So how did you how'd you get here? Sure, I guess we'll, we'll go back uh, a little bit further to, I guess, complete the whole circle. Um, I started after high school. I served as a firefighter, EMT and police dispatcher and worked in emergency services through most of my 20s uh, and then went back to school. I got a BA in history from Marist College and was thinking about pursuing graduate studies in history, but then ended changing gears, um, finishing a master's currently at Johns Hopkins University. I'm actually in the, the thesis uh, revision process as, as we speak right now, so I'll have a, an MA in government. Uh, I've been studying political theory and, uh, and governance at, at Hopkins. And during the time of the pandemic, I found myself in North Carolina uh, for many different reasons. Uh, one, uh, the I felt that the, the COVID rules were not as uh, excessive or draconian in North Carolina. Uh, I had a bunch of friends in North Carolina when I was thinking about where I wanted to live. Uh, I didn't have to be in person at Hopkins because of COVID. Thing, everything was fully online. So I found myself in North Carolina and ended up getting a job working at the North Carolina General Assembly. And I worked on the Senate side there and was a policy advisor uh, for a state senator who's uh, now the Senate Majority Leader in North Carolina and got to work on a whole bunch of cool policy areas. And that's really, I guess, where I got my feet wet and uh, sort of baptism by fire in the sort of policy wonkery world. Uh, I worked on uh, elections and redistricting, uh, worked a little bit on tax and finance, uh, some various elements of social policy, uh, focused a lot more, though, on uh, like election integrity policy uh, and then uh, energy and wound up becoming one of the primary policy advisors on a, a transformative piece of energy legislation in North Carolina. And that was one of the big, big projects I worked on before leaving the General Assembly, uh, where I found myself at the John Locke Foundation, uh, which is a public policy think tank uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, focused on uh, North Carolina policy. It's a you know center-right uh, think tank, uh, part of the SPN network, and found myself there doing uh, strategic projects and government affairs for them. Uh, and I'm still a visiting fellow there at the John Locke Foundation. I, 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 I like to say I do uh, little little projects uh, along the way to sort of earn my place on the website. Uh, and then, yeah, just recently in the last couple of months, I uh, was able to uh, move up to D.C. with my partner and found myself working at the National Taxpayers Union Foundation. That's, I guess, kind of the vignette of the journey here. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Uh, now. So we've talked in the show before about the difference between trying to get things done at the national or federal level and trying to get reforms enacted at the state level. So we've had great past interviews with uh, Kerry Conco of the State Policy Network. You just mentioned SPN. And uh, that was in episode 31. And your own former colleague, Brooke Medina from John Locke uh, in episode 16. Big fan uh, of Brooke. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering, can you go into uh, just a little bit more detail about the uh, the energy policy, the big energy policy change that happened in North Carolina that you you worked on, because uh, I saw you I saw you gave a great presentation at a conference not too long ago about well, that. You. So I thought it was a it was an interesting, uh, it's a useful sort of case study on mm. uh, how to get how to get something done when you know you're in a world of politics is world of conflict and compromise and and making the making the possible happen. So what what happened down there with energy policy? Yeah, and I think it is interesting too. It, it, it's fun. I think it's it's fun coming to DC having worked in state policy and state politics. I think a lot of people tend to do the the reverse. Uh, but for me, coming to DC, come, you know, for all my prior experiences at the state level, uh, at least in in policy and and politics. So having that state experience of coming to DC, I think sort of gives me a unique lens uh, how I'm sort of looking at sort of all you know the the, the swamp world uh, as it were. And I think more people should actually do that because we might actually end up getting a uh, some better results out of Washington. But because it's interesting being at the state level because you can you you have um you have much more uh, hands on. Uh, experience, I think, with a lot of different elements of policy and also seeing those policies become law. <clears throat> and that was something that we experienced with uh, House Bill 951, which was our energy bill. So how did that come about? So in North Carolina at the time when this was 
uh, passed and then signed into law, which was in 2021. Um, and it's still the case now. We had a Republican majority in the General Assembly and a Democrat governor. And the governor had very clear climate goals and environmental goals and energy goals that he wanted for the state. And the General Assembly had decided uh, that they wanted to also sort of take the reins on energy policy, but of course, uh, find where there might be compromise between sort of the governor's goals and what uh, Republicans in the General Assembly thought might be more reasonable, more conservative answers to some of these energy uh, questions. And what we ended up uh, coming up with, I believe, is sort of the reasonable and conservative response to sort of costly Green New Deal style policies. Uh, and I think we've actually created a model um, model legislation that other states could mirror or do something similar, depending on what their, their dynamic is. So what did we do? So we took the governor's uh, carbon reduction goals as a given. Uh, he wanted to reduce carbon from the 2005 levels, reduce them down by 70% by 2030, and then be uh, carbon uh, neutral by 2050. Now, carbon neutral is, is different from carbon net zero. Carbon neutral means that you can still have carbon on the grid. You just have to be offsetting it, essentially, uh, so in, in, in some way. So it's not it's not zero carbon. It's just carbon neutral. It just means at the end of the day, when you balance out the scales, it just has to it has to even out. So that was that was a given. So we operated on that premise. He was not going to sign anything more, anything less less than that. We sort of negotiated on other sort of guardrails, but that was where we landed on. So how are we going to get there? And what we decided was, is that the policy had to make sure that when we had a reliable grid and that we were not going to create ex excessive costs for ratepayers. So we effectively made two policy, uh, like two primary guardrails in the bill, and that was least cost and reliability. So we already had in statute in North Carolina, there was already elements of least cost, what that meant for the Utilities Commission. Uh, so there was something already defined in statute is what is the, the least cost pathway for, for generation. And we sort of just beefed that up a bit and said, yes, it must be holistically least cost. And that least cost has to actually be tied to reliability. And the language that was used in the bill was any changes to the grid cannot uh, it, it can't change reliability. It has to either improve upon or maintain current reliability. And we knew what those metrics were. So what did we believe that that did? We believe that, well, we didn't mandate anything. We didn't say you have to use X number of renewables, X number of nuclear, X number of natural gas. We sort of just said, no, the whatever you choose in all of the above approach, it has to be at least cost and it has to maintain or improve upon the reliability of the grid. And we had sort of hypothesized that that would lead the General Assembly to sort of re relying less on renewables, which are unreliable, and relying more on baseload dispatchable energy sources like natural gas or nuclear. And that's what we're seeing happen. I mean, now we're in 2023. It's been almost, oh, actually, it was two years in, uh, this month that the bill was, bill was passed. And we are seeing that the Utilities Commission uh, and the public utility in North Carolina are going towards nuclear power, um, opening the door to like SMR technology and also uh, looking to try to expand its natural gas portfolio. Uh, and, and so we we knew that it was going to uh, steer in those directions because the grid is designed to receive dispatchable baseload energy sources, right? The grid, and most grids are designed this way. Uh, the grid is designed to receive dispatchable baseload sources, not intermittent sources or non-dispatchable sources like wind and solar. So the am amount of money in the grid in grid modifications that you would have to do to accept large tranches of solar and wind, we knew would just be an astronomical number. Uh, so it was going to be the most cost-effective way to just bring on additional baseload and dispatchable sources. And that's what we're seeing happen. All right. I think that that's a really good example because I think when it comes to m making big changes, whether it's uh moving from investing in uh uh highways to investing in transit or moving from uh old old school energy to uh more sort of like climate sensitive uh, energy sources you have a lot of optimism on the side of people who want to move in this sort of uh, progressive direction and they say oh but don't worry it won't you know it won't impact reliability it won't cost anymore it'll be win 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 all the way around there's no reason not to do not to do this um but that doesn't obviously always end up being the case, right? Once you implement these like major structural, like industrial changes, sometimes, and we certainly see this with uh, transit projects, uh, unless you have a hard constraint, 
those those costs can start sort of spiraling out of control. And so I think you know it, it's a, a little bit sort of like legislative jujitsu here, where you're you're taking the promoters at their word, right? They're okay. giving you the most optimistic in, uh, interpretation of their plan, which is that it won't increase costs. And so it's easy to say, okay, great. Well, then you won't have any problem with us writing that into the bill <laughs> that it can't <laughs> increase costs. That, that, that's right. Yeah. Well, and it's because, you know, in a, in a diversified grid, renewables have a place, right? Renewables definitely have a place on the grid. And in North Carolina's case, depending on which study you read, you know, we were second or third in the nation in installed solar, for example. So we really did not, there was no need in a diversified grid to bring more solar onto the grid. There was not a need to bring more, to bring more wind. If we wanted to achieve carbon reduction, which the governor had the goals to do and was signed into the, signed into law. Well, if we want to do that at the least cost, most reliable pathway, then bringing on more renewables is not going to do that. Uh, and an argument that you'll hear a lot from sort of the environmental left, or at least from like, you know, the renewable lobbyists is that, well, it's, it's going to be so expensive to bring on, you know, a, a new nuclear facility on board that it, there's, and they'll use that metric to, to sort of say that our, ours is cheaper because to be sure the, the onboarding costs would be cheaper, but you get what you pay for, right? I mean, think of solar energy as kind of like the Ikea furniture of, 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 <laughs> of energy generation. Yeah. It's, it's gonna, it's gonna run as expected for a couple of years, maybe, but it's, it's not going to give you the longevity that a nuclear facility is going to do or beefing up a natural gas facility. And one of the other important elements that was in our bill in North Carolina was we gave discretion to the utilities commission every several years to revisit the carbon plan and look for technological advancements so like smr technology small module reactors for nuclear is a new technology that's coming on board and they're using that because duke energy is now being open to smr technology in the next decade or two we will probably see uh, advancements in carbon capture so you will not have to necessarily close down your nuclear facilities to reach carbon neutrality with something like carbon capture. Um, you might even be able to, you know, put on uh, or mothball your coal plants if you ever need them for 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 backup. So th there's a lot of there's, you know, you have to be prepared for technological advancements as well. And that's something we, we put into the bill. But you also have to think about holistic costs. Again, yeah, the upfront cost for a nuclear facility might may, may be cheaper, but you have to replace it in at least 25 years. There's no plans right now, at least in North Carolina, for the decommissioning of those solar panels. So they're either left out in the middle of the field or, you know, literally holes are dug and they're they're put into the ground. That can't be, you know, good for the environment. But also the when you look at land use, which is something that I think as anyone who's interested in, in environmental conservation, we we had determined, and I'm I'm just pulling the numbers off the top of my head. I, I don't remember exactly what they were, but it was it would have been over 3,000 square miles of land use that's essentially the entire piedmont in north carolina if we wanted to power the grid with all renewables three thousand square miles versus about five and a half to six and a half square miles of just nuclear like that's you know when we're if we're talking just straight up land use and environmental conservation to me that's a no-brainer and when we look in the the experience of rolling blackouts and if we care about low income rate payers in north carolina you want to do everything you can to make the grid reliable and to do it at least cost. Because the other thing to remember is that a reliable grid is also a least cost grid. Reliable grids are going to be cheaper because now you're not dealing with the cost of the other economic uh, elements that come from rolling blackouts or losing losing power. Because then now, now it's not just your your rate electric rates are going to go up, but all the food you purchased over this week are going to go bad because there's no power to power your fridge if, if we're dealing with blackouts. So a reliable grid is going to be a cost effective grid, uh, and that was that was something that we really drove home in policy, and that's something that I'm passionate about uh, that people should be driving in other states as well. Because I do think. You know, if we're going to practice proper federalism, there's a lot of room for states uh, to to engage in, in energy policy. It does not need to be a top down approach from from D.C. And if we get a, enough states that are going to get on board with similar types of legislation, it will compel uh, the sort of regulatory easements that need to be made at the federal level. It will be a lot easier to make those when you have more states that are, I think, on board with this with this kind of energy plan. All right. That sounds good. Now, sort of. Zooming out, that's a, a great, uh, like I said, I think it's a great case study at the state level on uh, tackling a, a sort of, you know, controversial, uh, you know, hot topic. But if we sort of zoom back up to the, you know, 30,000 foot level and look at politics in America, 
I, you know, I think one of the big topics going on right now is there's a sort of a realignment in some ways between between like left wing and right wing <laughs> uh, groups in this country, and uh, and we we've, we've talked about that here on the on on the show before. I think you you and I have talked about that before. Um, but uh, on the left, I think this is more the optimistic side, um, which and it goes a little to what we were just talking about. You got some people who are embracing more like free market reforms, and certainly in things like uh, land use and zoning and housing construction. You know, we had on the show episode eighteen, we had an interview with uh, about urbanism with Max Dubler. We had an episode fifteen interview with Alex Trembath about so called eco modernism, um, mm-hmm. and some people are throwing around the phrase supply side progressives, <laughs> which not not two things That's that fun. like go went together <laughs> so much previously. Um, so there's there's that sort of like kind of technocrat lefties who want to get stuff done and are are willing to like embrace some like market principles on that but on the other side which i think is the left less optimistic side uh we've got people more on the right who are going sort of in the opposite direction and advocating for you know more government control of the economy in lots of different ways um and so those are some those are sort of populist or nationalist kind of guys and so we talked about that uh, again on the show with stephanie slade and uh, from reason magazine in episode 17 and ovik roy not too long ago in episode 37 so, you know, we've got these two two phenomenons. One, you've got, I think, you know, again, my theory and my my colleague Ian Murray's theory that there's a realignment in general going on between left and right, but also specifically, uh, you know, con- conservatives for big government seems to be a thing now where it wasn't so much in previous decades. Where where are we at in this process? We're already we're not at the beginning anymore because we're already the train's already left the station in 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 terms of some of this realignment and and crack up <laughs> potentially. Where, right. where where is the next step for this? Yeah, and it's interesting because I think I go back and forth, but I I try to be much more optimistic than I think a lot of, or at least I'm trying to be more optimistic than um than a lot of I think my my colleagues sort of in the the conservative movement or those of us who are concerned about sort of you know the new right or whether that's you know national conservatism or something like post liberal Catholic integralism the these more authoritarian elements of the right or big government conservatives as you say um, I'm a little bit more optimistic that I think people there's a new there's there are I'm, I'm I constantly see younger generations of conservatives on social media who are uh, buying into sort of the more, for lack of a better term, the fusionist project. Um, you know, they're they're finding themselves more aligned with you know sort of the you know, national reviews principles that they just published out in their new magazine, uh, which I would recommend to any of your viewers to to read. It was in the in the the new uh, the new print edition. It's a, it's also available online of National Reviews magazine. They posted their principles. Effectively, what do we believe? As National Review is published by the editors, it was very good. Uh, a project that I've been a part of uh, called the Freedom Conservatism Project. We issued a statement of principles over the summer. I think there's a lot of overlaps between those two, and I'm seeing a lot of young conservatives. Um, falling onto that, you know, so and, and, you know, referencing, you know, Russell Kirk and William F. Buckley and, uh, you know, and Frank and Frank Meyer uh, as sort of their intellectual heroes. That's a good sign. But of course, as, as you point out, and we can't ignore, there is this tension right now on, on the right with what sort of people are calling sort of zombie Reaganism or the zombie fusionism. And then this new right that they, you know, because if you, if you are, if you're part of the old right, you don't know what time it is. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting when you, when, you, when one says that and these people are also usually pretty passionate about uh, about President President Trump. When you look at the successes of the Trump administration, most of those came from this so-called old right. I mean, especially I mean, some of his uh, his fiscal reforms for sure, uh, and definitely his appointments to the Supreme Court. I mean, those are legacy positions that have been put forward by freedom conservatives and sort of this the fusion coalition of of the of Ronald Reagan style conservative whatever you want to label us american conservatives is what i prefer to say uh those have been policy victories and we see when when they sort of attach themselves to this more um that this this populist trend away away from those sort of first first principles of of limited government free enterprise free markets uh constitutional conservatism uh they tend to lose and they have been losing so i think a lot of this is occurring in sort of the intellectual e- ecosystem of of the of the right, broadly broadly speaking, and I don't know that we're seeing this fully develop in the on the politics politics side. Of course, it's there. I mean, you've got like JD Vance in the Senate, and, there, and Josh Hawley are, are starting to you know go this way in, in some of their industrial policy and some of their other economic views, their position on, on unions, for example. And then I think we are seeing this in 
uh, the House right now with the the score the election for for Speaker. There's there's such a fracturing of these of the, of these different groups. But when you really look at the number of people or sort of the opposition to the establishment, so to speak, though those are still a small a small number. And I think most conservatives and most Republican voters in the country are still finding themselves in these sort of classical you know re, you know Republican uh, classical American conservative. Uh, understandings and principles that we've that we've come to know over, over the last se several decades. So I, I, I think we are at an interesting point where I do think the intellectual ecosphere is is uh, seriously fractured. Um, I think there is a battle right now amongst think tankers and, and wonks to sort of who is going to come out of this space on top, because then it will start to to bleed into politics. And when you see certain legacy uh, organizations like the Heritage Foundation buying into these kinds of things, and these are that's an organization that uh, elected officials definitely listen to, that's concerning to me. Um, so I'm not necessarily concerned at this moment right now, and this can change because th these things are in, in flux all the time. I'm not as concerned about the actual on the ground political implications of these yet, though we should be worried about what the trickle down effect will be from sort of the intellectual think tank um, ecosystem. Uh, but I think people are concerned about this. Um, and because I am starting to see a lot of a lot of, you know, young, younger conservatives coming out of college who are sort of aligning with us with, you know, with freedom, you know, sort of freedom conservatives and, and you know, National Review style conservatives of, of the sort of broader fusionist coalition. Um, we have to help them. Uh, you know, there's where the fellowships and the scholarships that are going to be, you know, getting them to the conferences, you know, that that was a space that something like Claremont used to do. And now they've or they've sort of are full on to the, the new right. Um, obviously, Heritage is a great space for that. And, and they're sort of more in the national conservative new right space now. So I think people who are interested in this and want to invest in this, particularly those in the in the donor community, there are groups and organizations who need help to how, how can we bring up the next generation of American conservatives? Um, so I'm optimistic, but I do think we have to we have to start doing something to prevent uh, sort of the the slouching towards authoritarianism that we're starting to see uh, on the right. But what I really think we need as Americans, both, uh, you know, right center, left center and the left and right broadly is a recommitment. We really need a recommitment to our, our founding principles and to the Constitution. I mean, even before when I was talking about energy policy, I, I talked about federalism. And this has to come from the states. Uh, I think, you know, the we have serious problems in this country, for sure. We have we have cultural problems. We certainly have policy debates and political tension. But, you know, the answer to those is not burn everything down and start all over. I think, you know, the, the founders had it right. Our principles are still are still good. So I think a, a returning a return to those principles and more robust federal, federalism, a return to uh, you know limited government principles properly understood that there is a role for government, but what should that role be? And government is always best when it's closest to the people. So I think a full investment in the local, uh, both culturally and politically, as conservatives is probably where we should be investing our time. Uh, so investing in the next generation of up and coming conservative intellectuals and potential uh, you know politicians in the future, but then also emphasis on the local. Um, and there's a lot of us doing that. So I am optimistic, uh, but I think that's where we are right now. Now is a time to, uh, you know, we, we've lost, I think, a, a certain portion of a generation because they grew up in the sort of post-2016 reactionary politics. And that's the only politics of the right that they know is sort of the Donald Trump MAGA reactionary populist uh, kind of uh, disposition. Uh, but there's still a whole generation that's right behind that, that I think we can we can bring into the fold and 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 help, uh, you know, help regenerate American conservatism properly understood. And then we right now in the policy space and in the ideas world, we need to be emphasizing the local and, and, st and emphasizing state governments, emphasizing a focus on state and local governments, and that that's where the uh, robust world of the policy world really needs to be. And let's get out of, not that there's a lot to fix in Washington, but I think I think if, if we if we if we want to start start somewhere, I think more robust federalism is where our focus should be. Nice. Well, uh, get local. Go join your local Rotary Club. That's right. <laughs> no, for real. For real. Go do yeah, that. Yeah. I, mean, and... I mean, and that's right. Invest in your invest in your community. Right. Like, I mean, like, where, and that's that's another thing, too. I mean, a lot of our this is something that, you know, like you've all uh, 11 at, at AEI talks about all the time is our institutions. It's not just our government institutions, though th those need correction. But it's also the idea of community, local community, the neighborhoods, the family, your local school, your local church, the Rotary Club, or, you know, whatever the the whatever the local center is going to be we need to we need to be a part of those mm -hmm. yeah i know that there is i think there's a lot of of good advice from some 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 conservative writers out there who uh would say like well you know uh 
okay, you know, young activists, you want to go out there and, you know, slay the dragon and uh, defeat your enemies and exile all the socialists and, you know, uh, have this like giant dramatic categorical victory. But, you know, maybe what you need to do is show up to a school board meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you need to do is help someone in your community. Maybe helping the elderly neighbor across the street is actually more important than a lot of social media edgelord posting that feels really exciting. That's right. I have a cup of coffee with these people. Like, have they ever actually sat down and had a conversation with the people they disagree with? You would, I mean, of course, there's going to be some people who are just, you know, we have irreconcilable differences and we are never going to, to come to any kind of, you know, a common ground on anything. But in my experience, you will just by meeting someone and, and having a conversation, that person is also a, a brother or a sister, you know, a, a, you know, a father, a mother, a husband or a wife, or, you know, they they, they have someone who loves them and cares about them. They also care about something. They may even both, they may even care about or have the same interests and hobbies that you do have conversations with these people, uh, even people on our own side, like, you know, conservatives, you know, who we like to have a lot of infighting, but have we ever, you know, let's go have a beer. Let's go have a cup of coffee. Let's talk about where where there's common ground. And instead of like trying to to fight to own to own the other person, no, let's ha let's let's have a good civil debate and and try to actually convince, but also listen, because you might be wrong. I might be wrong. And, you know, the other and and I think you, yeah. There's and this goes, I think, just to sort of civil discourse, which has you know, social media is good for a lot of things, but I think it has sort of. Um, Hold apart the social fabric of of, of sort of of civil discourse in a, in a in a lot of ways, and it's broadened uh, communities that we forget about. You know, the you know, how many of your neighbors do you actually know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think getting involved in things in your neighborhood. You know, are, well, what, I like uh, Jordan Peterson. What does he always say? Like you know, have you made your bed this morning or whatever, whatever <laughs> sort of thing? You know, before you get out and do all this great thing, but have you made your bed? I mean, it's it sounds kind of like silly and cliche, but it, but it's true. Um, is your own, especially as conservatives, is your own life in order? Uh, is, is, you know, are, are you, are you, uh, is your schedule uh, in a way that, that it's, it's rightly ordered? Are you getting the work done that you need to do? How is, is your family secure? Are your neighbors uh, safe? Is your neighborhood safe? Is, you know, then you kind of go out from there. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know if a lot of people are thinking that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of the, you know, we, we can't get into every, every possible uh, permutation of this uh, debate here, but there's, there's one element that I hear, I think is, is pretty important that we could touch on, which is, you know, some of uh, our our friends on the kind of populist nationalist right will say, well, this, you know, economic freedom isn't everything, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, we need to worry about like the safety and security of our, uh, of our country and of our society. And, and so it, it shouldn't just be about, you know, government policy shouldn't be about maximizing economic efficiency, right? Because there's more important things than merely being efficient. Um, and, and, and that's true, right? Efficiency is not the most m moral good in my life, certainly. Uh, however, um, the the question, you know, as as our old friend Thomas Sowell would say, the question is not not what is the right policy. The question is who is going to decide. And mm -hmm. so there are things that are more important than economic efficiency. But who gets to decide what those more important things are? Is it a planner? Is it a politician? Is it a bureaucrat? Or is it us and our families and our and our communities? Yeah. And 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 so that that's the thing that I always try and emphasize, which is the the economic freedom that you have in your life, what what job to have, how to you know save or invest your money. Um, you know, where to, where to buy stuff, you know, are you going to like pay more for the made in America stuff? Or are you going to like, uh, get more for your money with the imported stuff, whatever, all these economic decisions that have some moral implications, uh, should you be the person making that decision or should a small handful of people living in Washington, DC make those decisions? And the second, you know, the, what a lot of like the nationalists and populists who want more, you know, government control of the economy, who want more antitrust enforcement want more trade tariffs, all these things that uh, uh, what it comes down to what they wanting what they want is going to end up being a small handful of government bureaucrats in Washington DC making those decisions for everyone in America which doesn't seem like a very conservative principle to me right well and it, it's it's interesting because you know this this sort of becomes it becomes a battle for extremes right you either have to be so so free market that you uh you know you you almost become uh, like uh, you know like 
an anarchist or you have to be so central planning that no no you know everyone wants wants to try to just bring bring everyone to the extremes and and in real life is not like that there's there's a uh, a a a practical uh, middle that actually works and the truth of the matter is i mean for for conservatives i mean i'm not a libertarian so i probably have a slightly different view than uh libertarians are part of uh, part of this coalition or those who more side with that of course there's a place for government uh of course um it's when we talk about things like free trade like is it probably you know maybe maybe there is something wise about decoupling from our geopolitical uh rivals uh i mean i think even ronald reagan would, would not have i think advocated for sort of open trade with the soviet union um you know there's 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 practical and reasonable and, and prudential things we can do on everything from from trade to the economy but of, of course we know of course that we should always side on on free market capitalistic principles as the first impulse right we central planning we know is is bad it does not work we know we know this uh so the how we need to get as far away from that as possible not to say that there isn't a role for government intervention in any anything full full stop but we but I think as conservatives, we always have to be cautious about that intervention, right? Is it actually, how far is it going? And is it becoming coercive to a point where uh, it's actually, you know, impeding economic freedom? And economic freedom is still, it is linked to these these other things that we as conservatives and even those the, on the new right care about. Like, of course, you know, GDP is not everything, right? What does our culture look like? Uh, how, how, are, how are people living their lives? And if they're living paycheck to paycheck, and if they're not able to um, you know, have some of the, you know, like, you know, circumscribed, of course, but have plenty uh, in, in both, in both goods and, 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 and other things that they need to live and sustain their life. That that's part of, that's, that's part of a moral good. You have to have a, a strong e economy for people to be able to live their, their lives healthfully and, and, and be fulfilled. So these things are not disconnected. And I think they like to pretend that they're disconnected, but these things are obviously intertwined. And when we're talking about specific policies, who should make the decisions? I mean, conservatives and Republicans in the last just few years are making tremendous policy victories on things like, you know, school choice and parents' rights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're advocating for, you know, parents should be making the decisions about the educational future uh, and the educational freedom of, of their children, not, you know, not these sort of bureaucrats in our education departments. And what's funny to me is that you look at these sort of nationalist, populist, you know, new writers, and they love that. But then at the same time, they're also telling us that uh, there should be all of these other coercive elements of government that the government okay yeah we agree and i agree that yeah parents do know better for their kids future we should be empowering parents and educational freedom and school choice but then the disconnect for me is when then they then go okay well then now here's these all other things in life that we believe the government knows better than than even those parents who we just empowered so there's a clear disconnect there and i and i think because a lot of what we're seeing from the populist nationalist new right is these are just things that are antithetical to our not only our conservative tradition in this country but our political order properly understood they use constitutional arguments constantly to make these arguments for something that they they either outwardly or privately know is unconstitutional um so that there's this weird tension there so, and i'm not sure how to fix that with some of them but i think you know, there's 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 nothing new, right, or nationalist or populist about something like a parents' bill of rights or about school choice. Those are well within the 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 traditional American conservative canon, broadly speaking. And I don't know why those principles empowering families to make decisions doesn't extend to other parts of government where they they think that more government is needed in those areas. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Richard, but to me that seems like a disconnect, kind of what you're sort of what what you're getting at here. Yeah, I can definitely I I see that. A sort of tension there and it what you know what occurs to me in terms of you know the the broad view of are we do we want to empower the government especially like the u.s federal government to have more power over uh economic life in america it seems really at odds with what a lot of our conservative friends have saying been saying for years about china about the strategic threat from the people's republic of china and the way they manage their economy and the way they you know to use a fashionable term weaponize mm -hmm. uh finance to control their population and control their population's ability to express themselves and express political opinions dissent from from government uh you know we have the famous you know concept of the like the social credit score right so if mm -hmm. everything you do in the economy all your purchasing decisions and everything are tracked and then you are then the government is uh, uh doling out rewards and punishments based on sort of everything you do and if they decide that you're not you know, you're not towing the line. You're 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 being antisocial. You're being anti-government, and of course, in their view, right. those are one and the same. Uh, then they'll 
then they'll freeze your bank account. Then they'll stop you from being able to buy a plane ticket or a train ticket. And uh, so this is not just not just the PRC. This is not just the Chinese Communist Party. You know, we had uh, the the government in uh, Canada during these, you know, these trucker protests over COVID policy. Uh, the government just said, oh, we're just going to we're going to freeze your bank accounts if we know you're showing up to this this anti-government protest. Right. No, uh, no due process. We're just going to freeze your bank account. And so you can't do anything. You can't spend your money. Um, uh, but it also means you can't express yourself. Right. So the economic part is not just dollars and cents by manipulating your ability to save and invest and spend your own money. They're also controlling at the very least, potentially, and sometimes explicitly your ability to express your political opinions and live your life. And right. I think the, if, we want to sort of safeguard a future, you know, where 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 this is does does not happen here. What we want to do is not give the government more power over economic uh, over the economy, right? And so again, a lot of the same people we're we're talking about, we may we may disagree with on other issues, have been coming out very strongly saying we shouldn't have us, you know, the Federal Reserve should not have a central bank digital currency that's completely centrally, you know, computer controlled from from Washington, where they can just sort of like delete your dollars if you do something the government doesn't like. Um, right. And so I so I think because because we have conservative friends who are real fire eaters, you know, hard, hardcore guys about uh, national security and defense policy and, 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 and understand that the policies of the Chinese Communist Party are a big threat, um, not necessarily all the Chinese people, but the, the policies of the current government, uh, that maybe that is sort of a way to say, well, actually, giving the government more power over, uh, over the economy is, is maybe a bad idea because it, it could be used by even if even if we think it's going to be used by honorable people today. Those people aren't always going to be around. There could be worse people who get a hold of those powers in the future. That that's right, and I think that's also part of my optimism too. That there are politicians in the mainstream who are obviously using the arguments as as you as you do. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, you know, I, there might be some uh, post liberal uh, integralists out there who would look to China as a model, and they exist. Uh, again, that's an in, that's a very niche uh, in, you know, intellectual sphere problem, but I don't see that bleeding into the mainstream politics. I don't even think you know Donald Trump would be obviously advocating that we should uh, you know have the social currency and the policies of the People's Republic of China, and I don't see most politicians politicians on Capitol Hill, uh, holding those views so we can be thankful uh, for, for that. You know, I, one, one, other, one other point I think is, is along this, like the robustness of the federal government. I, I think, you know, going back to like the federalism question, which is something I think conservatives really need to be holding on to and, and pushing forward. I do think there's more space for state and local governments to get, I, I hate to use the word coercive, but in the broadest sense that it is, they, they, there's, you know, cultures are different in different states and even in different localities. So I think there, there, you know, you, you can have a more narrow focused or narrow, narrowly tailored law, in a out of a local government, you know, county or state government, than you can this sort of broad brushed for the entire country, because a lot of there's we have first principles, we have constitutional first principles as 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 a nation, and obviously there's as citizens of this country, we have liberties that are extended to us regardless of where you live. But but there are there are different needs, right? There are political, social, cultural, and policy needs that are different in North Carolina versus California or Texas versus New York, uh, and that's a reality that I think that, that people have to understand is that. You know, and as long as freedom, freedom of movement along among the states is, is not inhibited, then, yeah, there might be laws you might that you might feel might be overly uh, obtrusive to me if I were to, to live here, but I can live someplace else and, and not have that. And not to say that as long as the of course, as long as those laws are constitutional, but I think there's there's more room for that level of robustness amongst the states than there is for a top down approach from the federal government. And when you look at something like you know, sort of juxtaposing like you know, like a freedom conservatism view versus a national conservatism view. You know, freedom conservatives will believe in that. I think believe in that robustness and that and that robust federalism. Uh, so far to say that again, not I'm not speaking for everybody. I'm speaking for myself and why I align with that view is that yeah, there might be room for a a. Uh, I'm not thinking about any policy in particular, but a particular social policy in one state that might be more robust than it is in another state. There had there I think there should be room there should be room for that again so long as it's. You know, constitutional, of course, and following the, the the rule of law. But when you look at the national conservative statement of principles, they say we affirm federalism, but if and only if <laughs> there has, and I forget the words that they use, but they talk about, you know, a state has just gone so far into immorality that they're irreconcilable and need to be brought back into the fold, essentially is what they're saying. So again, it's like, okay, you're allowed, you, you the states are allowed to have federalism so long as you adhere to the national regime. 
Otherwise, the national regime is going to reel you back in. That that seems to me antithetical to our constitutional order, properly understood, and it's certainly not conservative. Um, you know, and 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 even like going back to the sort of the role of government, I think what we're the best expression I think right now again of of this coming from conservatives and coming from mainstream Republicans are things like school choice and and, and parents' rights. Um, those are winning policies. So for, for on the political side, those those are popular amongst the electorate. But I think they're also rightly ordered for our view of limited government and the role of the individual and of and of and of families. And those same principles that we're adhering there should extend into other places. And I think a freedom, a I think most freedom conservatives would be an, aligned with those. And I quite frankly think most NatCons and most of the new right are aligned also with a parents' bill of rights and and something like you know school choice. Uh, so. If, if that's something we align on, there's obviously underlying principles there that we can maybe extend into other areas of policy. So let's maybe try with those of us who are willing to talk and negotiate. Let's do that. Well, yeah, and I think the uh, you know school choice and, uh, and you know parental rights and education is uh, a good example of this because the you know the other big aspect about this you know besides that you know economic freedom isn't just about money it's it's about the moral aspect of freedom uh is that uh some of these things are government policies that are naturally government responsibilities and some of the things just aren't right right so there there's there's things that government needs to control because that's the reason why it was instituted in the first place right you probably mm -hmm. don't want to privatize department of defense um sure. <laughs> right. uh and it's and certainly as as states and, and, and policies is currently constructed, there are certain things that the government is absolutely in charge of in, in a state, uh, state run, you know, government run schools. Uh, it is the government's responsibility to ensure that they're run well. Right. right. And part of that is giving is now in many states, giving people options, but to the extent that government schools still continue to exist, they have to be managed by the state government. Cause that's the whole, that that's how that works. Uh, and the right. same true is true of state, colleges and universities, I would say. Uh, you know, there's a big debate in Florida over what Governor DeSantis is doing down there with, uh, uh, you know, um, putting uh, rules and restrictions or guidance, maybe they might say, on on what uh, state colleges and universities can can teach and can't teach and how they should give tenure and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's sort of the specifics of that are controversial. But at the end of the day, those are institutions of state government. And right. it is not just the ability of the governor and legislature. It is their absolute responsibility to manage it as they see fit. And if people don't like how they're managing, they can vote for someone else next time. Um, That's the right. same thing with uh, like state pensions, for example, has become a big issue in something I write about, environmental social governance, investing ESG, sort of you know, mm -hmm. progressive style investing. Uh, about whether you know state state pensions should or should not invest in these sort of like environmental ESG themed uh, options, and so. A bunch of states, mostly mostly Republican majority states, have have tried to to restrict the state pensions, you know, the teachers' pension, police pension, things like that. But those pension funds from investing in these sort of, you know, I would say sort of left wing kind of environmental themed investments. And people said, oh no, no, you can't do that. You're 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 playing politics. You're you know being intrusive. The the these elected state Republicans shouldn't be sticking their nose in this. And and say, like, well, if it were a private investment fund, then no, they shouldn't stick their nose in it. But it's explicitly a, it, something that is part of the state government. It is not right. just their ability; it's their requirement to manage it as best as they see fit. Um, so, when it, you know, the the problem is a lot with a lot of these issues. People just uh, uh, kind of decline to make that distinction. And and if and if things are being managed the way they like, then everything's great. If things are being managed they don't like, then it's quote political interference. <laughs> um, Without realizing that there are some things that are are just voluntary parts of the normal economy that should be left alone by government, whereas there are things like state pension funds and state universities and state public schools at this primary and secondary level that have to be managed by the state government and therefore should just be managed as well as possible. Um, and and so if you want to have an influence on quote society, right? You can you can write a best-selling novel, right? You can go out and give speeches, um, but you can't use the force of government to just tell people they need to live their lives differently. Uh, but what you can do, and what you should do, I think, if you want to make that difference, is through politics, is influence something that is actually part of politics, that is part of government, that is a that is that is supposed to be intended to be designed to be part of the function of government and that you you do have as much a, a right to influence as anyone else as any other voters any other american citizen mm -hmm. 
Sure. So that yeah. wasn't really a question. That was, that was yeah, more of a say, Yeah, it's splendid. Well done. <laughs> and and so we, you know, sometimes as uh, sort of like public policy people, we, you know, we like to be too, you know, uh, too too highfalutin to uh, muddy ourselves in uh, actual uh, electoral politics and be like elections those are those are for the common people we are high minded people who only think enlightened thoughts <laughs> um, but but obviously all these debates are going to have have an impact in the next uh, presidential election coming up uh, in 2024 uh, and so um, you know we are uh, I'm I'm an employee of a 501c3 designated IRS a regulated organization so we do not engage in electioneering or we're not we're not for or against anyone uh for office but we can certainly talk about how ideas will have an impact right on political debates so um do you think this is these sort of like tensions between the like you know uh you know traditional conservatives and the big government conservatives are they are, are they getting are they getting worse are they getting less have we hit a a, a a, a turning point uh, are things accelerating are they decelerating uh what do you think yeah I, again I, I think like, like i said at the beginning I, I do think this is still primarily in the sort of intellectual ecosphere it's it, i don't think it's fully at its full expression in the political sphere quite yet although we have seen pockets of it right i mean i think even in the uh you know in the republican primaries i mean mike pence has, has been hitting hard on this right he's been sort of attacking populism and trying to say you know we need to return back to you know reagan republicanism and and sort of the, you know these more tra more traditional uh re traditional republican party on traditional american conservative principles so i mean he's he's called it out and i think that's uh, and for a lot of people i know some of my friends who are not politicos uh, when we were talking about it, they're like, hey, this is like stuff that you talk about, but I've never heard a politician like use like the phrases about like, you know, dealing with this, you know, you know, with populism and and sort of this this juxtaposition between populism and, and traditional American conservatism. So it has it has emerged a, a little bit. Uh, and I think in the debates, I mean, I think, you know, seeing some of the the candidates who are who are running, I I, I mean, I, you see pockets of it, right? I don't think it's expressed in, in such a clear way where we all talk about it kind of in the think tank world about the, the new right or elements of this, but you can, you can see, I think you can see in some of the, the candidates policies, how they're framing conversations, who's more of a populist bend and who's more of a traditional conservative bend. Uh, and I think people who are even slightly aware of politics can tell um, who's, who's in, who's in, who's occupying what lane and in what space and speaking to which part of the base, but, he, but even, even some of like the, the, the base voters, like I think even those who, would align themselves with the more populist side or even be like a, a Trump voter. I don't know that they're, that they're so, um, I don't know that these are people are anti-free markets. I don't know that these people in their minds, they probably still see themselves as, as Reagan Republicans in, in many ways. So the disconnect that's been made in the intellectual, you know, in the conservative intelligentsia about, you know, are you a post-liberal Catholic integralist? Are you a Nat Con or a free con where we're having those, those debates and walks are having those debates, but I don't know that that's, those are, had, those are, I can promise you, those are not, those are not happening um, uh, for, with, with everyday Americans and, and with, and with the, the voters. Um, so, and that's not to say that those kinds of debates won't ever trickle down into those areas. I, I think they might, um, and hopefully by the time they do, there's been a reckoning to bring us, you know, back into some sort of uh, place of balance on these issues. Um, so again, I kind of just return return back to I don't I don't we're not I, I think at at you know the you know the democracy dies in darkness days. Um, I'm still very hopeful. Uh, I think the constitutional is still functioning. Of course, we have our we have problems in this country, but if the, if if our constitutional order was not working things would be way worse and i don't think people you know everyone likes to say how horrible the country is and how bad it is but even for conservatives we've had conservative victories uh i mean the, the, the whole i mean one of the, the, the one of the greatest things that come out of the trump administration and you one one can feel however they want to about uh, trump and his policies and his overall disposition um but the fact that we had a a, conser a conservative originalist majority on the supreme court to overturn Roe v. Wade and send that back to the states. That's a major conservative victory and, and one that the conservative movement and the conservative uh, legal movement in particular has been working on for, for decades. That's prudential conservative change that has now been actuated. Something has actually um, has actually happened. A lot of the fiscal reforms that we've seen come out uh, you know, in the last several decades and things specifically things on tax reform that have been coming from conservatives and Republicans for the last several decades. Uh, we, we've had conservative, we have conservative victories. Um, you know, again, school the, the the growth we've made on school choice and on parents' rights and education. Um, conservatives are winning. 
so I think this um, want this wanting feeling of victimization on the right uh, and sort of saying like we are, we're constantly losing, we're constantly losing in America, slouching towards the the socialist left. I I don't think things are as dire as people are trying to make it. So I am much more much more optimistic. I don't think we're standing at the the edge of the abyss quite yet. All right. Well, I like that optimism. Uh, well, we know what time it is in America, and it's time it's time for us to wrap up this particular uh, podcast interview. As fan as fantastic as it has been, uh, uh, thank you, Andre, for being with us. And uh, tell us uh, where where do people where do people find you online and, and follow you and, and stalk you? Oh, sure. Yeah, all of the above. Um, they, they, uh, I'm on I'm on uh, the website formerly known as Twitter. Uh, you can find me. I, what's my handle? I think it's at the real Bellavo on on Twitter. That's probably the best place. And I'm on, you know, LinkedIn. And you can find me on, you know, either like the NTU's website or the John Locke website. And there's ways to contact me there as well. But Twitter is a place I live, unfortunately. So if I, you can find me there. <laughs> All right. So if you are if you are a politics obsessed weirdo like us, um, and not and not and not one of those normal people in America who is not yet worried about <laughs> all this stuff, uh, then uh, then we'll see you on Twitter. All right. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Richard.